this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe broken generation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptation, we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, that He's coming back, He's coming back again. Good morning, church. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Psalms, chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. I came in Paris three years ago to study my master degree in architecture. I chose architecture because I want to do something with art. And my family, they want me to work with them and continue the family business. My first year, I used to share an apartment with a friend. I like to spend most of the time by myself. I didn't like what I was doing in school. My work came out really dull, and I didn't. I I, I thought that. Architecture was not my thing. I was alone, not with my family. I tried to pray, tried to meditate. In Thailand, I was a monk for three months. I didn't 
have any contact with anyone. I practice meditation almost every day. And I reach to a certain state where you try to avoid feelings. The point of Buddhism is we try to achieve nothingness in mind. There is just emptiness everywhere. I tried to find a way to bring this passion back of living. I was lacking at that time. I wanted to start anew. I met a girl at an architectural firm in Paris. One time, she went, went out by herself to eat lunch. And when she came back, I asked her, why don't you want to eat with us today? She said, oh, I was in the park by myself eating food. I was enjoying my time with God. Like, whoa, it seems like it's someone rather than a theory or a concept. It's someone. I began to ask my friends about Christianity. We began to exchange our knowledge between Buddhism, Christianity. After that, I started to be more interested. One day in church, I had my first encounter of the Holy Spirit. People started to pray, started to cry. And there was this group leader who came and said something that really changed my life. She said that I am perfect, that I am beautiful, that I don't need to try. Somehow that chain inside me was released. Before, I tried to be better, I wanted to study Buddhism and try to meditate to achieve something that is higher. That disappeared at that moment. It's God who was talking to me. It was so powerful that I burst into tears. I laid down on the floor um, with my face down. So I said to myself, I know that you can change people and I wanted to put my faith in you. Everything just clicked at that time. After that, I felt like talking to people. I wanted to express my joy because it fills you up and you just can't help but to, to let it out. My friends in church has been a lot of encouragement for me and I can sense their love. God changed how I view architecture. He gave me back the passion for my work. He showed me how architecture can really influence community. I think what I really like is creating space for communion for people coming in together. If you live in a place where there's love, that's where God lives. My generation now, they are finding their passion. They think a lot of what they wanted to do in the future. I just want to tell them, seek God first. Did you hear the last few sentences the man said in the video? My generation now, they're finding passion. They think a lot of what they wanted to do in their future. I just want to tell them, seek God first. My generation now, they are finding their passion. They think a lot of what they wanted to do in their future. I just want to tell them, seek God first. I believe he's right. Have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? what his plans are for you, what he wants you to do, what he wants you to be. When, when my daughter Paige was three or four, I was talking to her and, and I posed the age-old question, what do you want to do when you grow up? She thought for a minute, then she looked up and said, I want to go shopping. Have you, ever, have you ever had moments like that? where someone's asked you to ponder God's will for your life and all you can think of is something on, on the very surface level. Now, I'm not sure that shopping is the primary goal that God has for Paige's life. And, and now two decades later, neither does she. We live, we live in a society that says you can do anything you want as long as you believe in yourself, as, as long as you dream big enough, as long as you try hard enough. But is that idea true? Boy, I, I don't think it is. I, I know in saying that, I, I probably dashed a few hopes and dreams, but, but that's okay. It's okay to let go of things that are not rooted in truth. When we ask people, when we ask them what they want to do with their lives, we're really asking the wrong question. The better question is what does God want to do with your life? What does God want you to do 
so that his son can be seen in you and his ministry can flow through you? This is a question that all of us should ask, no matter what our age. Here's the question. What does God want me to do with my life? What does God want to do in me and through me? He does want to work in you, and, and he does want to work through you. And, and I know this is true because it's rooted in God's word. Last month, August of 2020, our memory passage was taken from the last part of Romans chapter 12. This month, September 2020, our memory passage is from the first part of Romans 12. Romans 12, 2. Scripture says, Therefore I urge you, and I'm going to start in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Now, God desires for us to dedicate all of who we are, all of our mind, soul, body, spirit, our, our entire being to him, everything about who we are. I want to focus this morning on verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You and I can know God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for our lives. Now, you may have the idea that you've blown it with your life. Maybe that your opportunities are gone. Maybe it's too late in life for you to follow God's purpose for you. Maybe you think that the setbacks of life have scuttled your hopes for tomorrow. But know this, God still has a plan for your life. He wants to use the time you have on earth to impact others for his good. And he wants to, through that, reveal his love for you. Now, I know God's will um, I, I know that it's God's will that, that you must stop being conformed to the pattern of the world. That's what Romans 12, 2 says. Uh, to know God's will, you have to stop being conformed to the pattern of this world. We know that from Scripture. In my backyard, I have several apple trees. Now, our yard is, is not all that big, so we've tried to make the most of the space we have. Now, sometimes that means cramping plants into places, tighter spaces, than maybe they're used to growing. When we moved to our house 17 years ago, I planted several, seven apple trees uh, across this, a stretch of fence that's about 15 feet long. Now, you know, apples, apple trees usually grow big and round, but this wasn't going to work for these trees because of the space. They were right up against the fence. So I built a horizontal frame along our fence and began the process of bending the branches and binding them to the frame. Over the years, they've taken on the pattern of the frame and the fence. Last year, the, the fence had to be replaced. And when the frame was released from the fence and the frame released from the branches, the branches remained horizontal rather than bending up to the sky. Do you ever feel like the world has conformed you like that to its image? We're constantly bombarded with the pressures that, that prevent us from experiencing God's best for our lives. For us to not conform to the pattern of the world, it's helpful for us to know uh, where we're being conformed. Now, here are three questions that we can ask that will help us identify things that bend us to the way of the world. One thing we can ask is this, what things distract your focus on Jesus? Scripture tells us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep our hearts on Jesus, to keep our passions focused on Jesus, and clearly there are things that draw our attention away from him. What are those things for your life? A second question is, is what things muffle the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life? The Holy Spirit of God convicts our lives of sin. He shapes us in the image of Christ, and he calls us to follow him. But sometimes things get between us and him, and his voice is muffled. 
A third question we can ask, a third question is, is what are the things that draw you away from God and lead you to sin? All of us have those, uh, those places in our lives where we're vulnerable to sin. To know God's will, we must be transformed through the renewing of our mind. To know God's will, we must be transformed and conformed into the image of Christ. What are the things that we can do that allow the transformation of our minds? Well, one thing is to be proactive in fostering the right thoughts. If you want good fruit to develop in your life and in your mind, you have to plant the right seeds. In a garden, if you want tomatoes, you plant tomatoes. If you want zucchini, you plant zucchini. If you want sweet peas, you plant sweet peas. The struggle is that we tend to reach into the bag with mixed seeds and we fill our minds with all kinds of stuff that seems harmless at the time. But in the end, those things grow to be plants that choke out the good fruit, choke out their ability, the good plants, the good fruit, their ability to thrive. The solution is to reach into the good source, the reliable source, the place of guaranteed seed, the word of God. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if it's excellent or praiseworthy, worthy, think about those things. Whatever you have learned, Paul says, or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the peace of God will be with you. When we dwell on the things of God, the things that are pure and noble, excellent, holy, our minds are transformed by his word and renewed by the Holy Spirit. And so we're proactive in putting good things in our minds but we can also be proactive in blocking the wrong thoughts. As we do that, we need to know that the world is going to continue to toss their seeds into our field every time we plant good ones. You get seeds tossed your way every day. It's, it's on our news feeds. It's in our inbox when you check your email. Subject lines that promise this and that if you click and look and buy. Seeds are tossed our way as we click our way through entertainment on our computers and our TV. The stuff that goes in our eyes and in our ears settles in our mind and it takes root. We have to recognize these things that are not from God and say no to them and remove them from our lives. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5 gives us a picture of what this battle for the mind is like. Verse 3 says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. When we identify the stuff in our lives that blocks our ability to thrive and produce fruit for Jesus— when we identify those things, we have to take hold of them, take them captive, and hand them over to Jesus. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. To know God's will, we have to stop being conformed to the pattern of this world. To know God's will, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then scripture tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, then you will be able to test and prove, to examine and interpret, to consider and understand his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then you will be able to prove, examine, interpret, consider, and understand his good and pleasing and perfect will. This is a promise that God has made to us through these verses. When we are less and less conformed to the pattern of this age, the pattern of this world and its systems, and the more we are renewed in the way of our thinking, thinking led by the Holy Spirit, grounded in the Word of God, we will be able to discern God's will for our lives. Now, this will is testable. And let me give you uh, several ways that we can test to see if this is God's will. We ask the question, does this align with the Word of God? 
The Holy Spirit of God will never ask us to do anything that's contrary to the Word of God. A second question we can ask is, is this consistent with how God has gifted me? Now, sometimes God grants increased spiritual gifts, but sometimes he limits our spiritual gifts to keep us in our lane and in the center of his will. A third question that we can ask is, do I have the capacity and resources to accomplish this will? Sometimes God grants increased capacity and resources, but sometimes he limits our capacity and resources to keep us in the center of his will. Another question we can ask, a fourth question, is do I have the capacity and the resources to accomplish this? Our daughter, Paige, uh, is home from college this weekend, and I was talking to her about these things, and I asked her a hypothetical question. Yesterday, I asked her, do you think at this point in my life, with the years that I have left, the skills that I have, do you think that I could become the greatest skateboard writer in the world? She kind of looked at me and she started laughing and she said, no. And then I said, no, no. If I believed it was God's will for me, could I do it? And she asked this question, well, how would that advance the kingdom of God? Kind of avoiding the question. And that's a great question to ask. And, and I said, no, do you think it would be God's will for me to be the greatest skateboard writer in the world at this point in my life? And she said, uh, no. And I said, why? And I went ahead and finished for her. I said, because I don't have the physical capacity or the training or the passion for skateboarding. I've never done more than a wobble on a board in my driveway, and some of those wobbles didn't end up well. It is unlikely that becoming the best skateboard rider in the world is part of God's plan for me. And she agreed. Now, God often stretches us by asking us to do something uncomfortable or outside our comfort zone. That that's part of following Jesus. He regularly asks us to take big steps of faith. Most of the time, God's will is revealed through how he has hardwired us and gifted us. And how he speaks to us the way he's used us in the past might be a glimpse of how he wants to use us in the future. Here, here are five questions you can ask as you work through understanding God's will for your lives. These things are suggestions, and, and I think that they're consistent with Scripture. And so we could ask these questions when we're wrestling with God's will for our life. The first is this, and they're going to come quickly. The first is this, does this bring honor to God? The question that Paige asked, you know, how will this advance the kingdom? Does, does this bring honor to God? And then, do I have the capacity uh, to accomplish this thing that I think I'm supposed to do? A third question is, do I have the opportunity to do this? Is there a place where I can do it? A fourth question is, do the people around me that I trust that are in love with Jesus confirm what God is saying to me? And a fifth is, will this advance the cause of Christ? Will others know and experience the love, ministry, and message of Jesus as I follow this will? Will people come closer to knowing Jesus, and will I fall more in love with Christ as I pursue his will for my life? You and I can know God's perfect, pleasing, and, and good will for, for us. God's will for you is not the best plans you can muster. God's will is not the best collective decisions of the masses. God's will is not the best collective decisions of, of past generations. God's will, this big picture plan for you, is that you be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Romans 8.29 says that we are transformed by the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8.28 says, let me, says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 29. We are uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, in this process of becoming more like Jesus, God will become, uh, God's will be, will become more clear to us. And it, it's not always going to be at a, with a full understanding of his plans because sometimes he just gives us a glimpse, enough of a glimpse to take the next step. But as he reveals his will to us, 
know that we can trust him as he leads us. So as you think about these verses, as you think about Romans 12, 8, ask the Holy Spirit to transform your mind, your spirit, your entire being, and to make you more like Jesus. Now, this step can only come if you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, because it's only through Jesus that we have an unimpeded, unimpeded relationship with God. And, and the moment that we place our trust and faith in Jesus, we experience this unfettered access to the Holy Spirit of God. But faith in Christ is a prerequisite. When we place our trust in him, the Spirit resides in us and begins to overhaul our lives. But we have to give the Holy Spirit permission to work in us. We have to give him the permission to do the, the remodel within us so that our minds are more like Christ. We also must give ourselves fully and completely to God's work in us. A simple prayer of surrender, something like this, God, I have, I have all kinds of ideas for myself, but I surrender them to you. And Jesus, I give you full control of my entire being. Holy Spirit, be in control of my decisions and my plans. You be the one to direct me. Now, this kind of prayer is one that you may say on a regular basis for the rest of your life as you desire to grow wider and deeper in your faith and in your walk with Jesus. And then we discover God's will for us. And when we have, pursue it with the fullest uh, energy that you can muster. Uh, pursue God with your soul, your heart, and your mind as you love your neighbor as yourself. As he reveals his will for you, his plans, his strategy, his blueprint, his design, his destiny for you. Pursue it with everything you are. Experience this better way to live, a better way to love, a better way to serve, a better way to be. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Jesus, my prayer for my friends this morning, in these short minutes that we've had together, is that your spirit would have taken uh, your words and, and rooted them in the hearts and in the lives of people. Jesus, your word is so clear that you have plans for us and you desire to use us. And so I pray that you would remove from our lives things that would block our vision, things that would muffle our ears, things that would harden our hearts so that we could understand fully how you want us to live. Give us opportunities to exercise our faith and opportunities to use the gifts that you've given to us. And Jesus, we will give you honor and glory for all the things that are accomplished. I ask your blessing on my friends. In your name, amen. grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see
sun forbear to shine but God who calls me here below will be forever mine will be forever We started our worship service today with a compilation of, of verses from Psalm 33, and that's how I'd like to close. Psalm 33 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. The Lord foils the plans of the nations, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever the purposes of his heart through all generations. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. May you serve Christ well this week as you share his unfailing love with the world.